thanks for inviting me out uh, on this wonderful day. You know, I had to interrupt my vacation in Florida to come here, you know, so. Uh, well, anyways, uh, I'm here to talk uh, about silica today. I want, I want to tell you a few things about myself first is uh, uh, I did uh, teach high school for four years, so one thing that you notice about me is I'll never turn my back on you. <laughs> All right, and uh, you know, I saw these nice rocks here. If people start falling asleep, I think I just, you know, sit on a table and play with the rock, I'm bang them on there. Or just recently. But, uh, but that, if I'm really bad, you could probably throw these at me too, so that would be good. Anyhow, uh, I'm an industrialized pianist. I work for Workplace Safety Consultation. We're kind of like the free OSHA people. You know, you can ask us to come out and help you with safety and health things, and everything is free. Uh, so if you want stuff like air monitoring or noise monitoring, I can do that. I can come through the facility. I, I saw that beautiful video, and I'm going, oh, I want to see that stuff, you know. Um, and uh, I can help you with health and safety programs. Uh, basically, my job is to help you guys. So if you want me to come out, you can give me a call, send me, an, send me a text, email, and uh, I can set it up with you guys to uh, help you out with, with whatever you need. Um, before I stopped here this morning, I actually stopped at another place. I have noise sampling going, so once I get done, with my uh, presentation here, I get to go back there and pick up my stuff. But anyways, uh, everything that we have is written in this brochure over there, what we can do for you. Uh, last thing I want to tell you about our program is that uh, we have a safety grant program. Uh, we give away about a million dollars a year to people like you that want to make improvements health and safety wise. And quite frankly, in the uh, silica industry or the landscaping industry, there's a lot of stuff that we're going to be talking about, new equipment and things of that sort that don't put out any silica into the air or actually reduces it. You can use that grant money to buy stuff for your workplace. Okay? Do you have any questions? All on there. And of course, I work for the government, so we give away all kinds of free stuff, right? We take your taxes and we convert it into trinkets. <laughs> so, I got some junk drives over there. Help yourself. These are government issued junk drives, so you got to be careful what you put on there because you know, you put on like social security numbers or bank account numbers. That stuff's all transmitted to us. <laughs> but on nah, I'm just kidding. Well, we have all that stuff already. <laughs> <laughs> And then something that you probably really could use is we have these good high-tech uh, recording devices. I you like them. Okay, you guys have any questions before I get going? Uh, the thing I want to impress upon you guys is that my job really is to help you guys. So if you have any questions, if you need anything, give me a call. All right, today we're talking about silica. The reason why we're talking about silica is, well, you'll find out. Uh, we had some new silica rules that were uh, actually implemented on March 25th, 2016. All these rules are in effect right now. And uh, some of the reasons for the rules is that the previous permissible exposure levels were really horrible. And they're hard to understand. Uh, I started with OSHA about 20 years ago, and the construction permissible exposure levels were written down in particles per, per particles per cubic meter. No, million particles per cubic meter. You know, I've never measured that. We just can't measure stuff like that anymore. So, I mean, the rules were so old, it was kind of like they're chiseled in stone and you had to uh, measure it like Fred Flintstone would measure it. Uh, we actually had to use new techniques to measure the stuff and then convert it into these old units. 
Oh yes, who runs this one? Uh, okay. Um, and the big deal is that uh, the previous uh, permissible exposure levels to silica just didn't adequately protect people. Uh, we know that uh, silica is bad stuff, and we know that it causes silicosis, lung cancer, uh, COPD, kidney disease, and that uh, we have lots of evidence, and this is human type evidence, that suggests that uh, if you have exposures below 100 micrograms, you can still get these things. That's 100 micrograms per cubic meter of air. So if you take a look at a cubic meter of air, yeah, probably about this size right here, 100 micrograms, that's, a, that's 100, that's, microgram is a millionth of a gram. So we're not talking about a lot of silica at all. Okay, so very, very, very small amount. You couldn't see 100 micrograms in the air. In order to actually see the stuff in the air, you would need probably about five milligrams. So that's like 5,000 times more to actually be able to see the stuff in the air. Anyhow, health benefits. By implementing these new rules, you will protect your health and the health of your employees. Uh, it could save probably somewhere around 600 deaths a year. Uh, 124 lung cancers, about 320, 325 silicosis, and a couple hundred uh, kidney disease deaths. All right, um, here's where this gets interesting. Um, I'm kind of a little fuzzy today because I picked up my wife at the airport at 12 o'clock last night. <laughs> and uh, her sister just died from lung cancer on Sunday. And she never smoked. And so for me, I always, it uh, kind of puzzled me, why did, she, why did she get this horrible disease? Did anybody ever watch anybody who went away from lung cancer? Well, it's a slow, painful, and ugly death. Um, I did a presentation a few years ago, and it took me about three hours to come up with this slide, by the way. I mean, if you punch in lung cancer deaths and causes and stuff, you're not going to get a list like this. And so I put this together, and, and obviously smoking is the number one cause of lung cancer. After that, it comes right on gas. You guys tested your house for radon gas? Okay. I have. So those are the two <coughs> biggest ones. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other things. And how, many of, how much of this other stuff really contributes, it, it's hard to tell. But my sister-in-law never smoked. And I know where she lived for the last set or last 68 years, and I'm certain that radon gas was not a problem. Where she grew up, she had a house, uh, her, her childhood house, she slept on a second floor. But radon gas is not going to be a, any kind of issue there. And then she's always had slab on grade homes after that. And so it's unlikely that there'd be radon issues in, in those homes. And so now it gets down to all these little things that, yeah, secondhand smoke. Yeah, could have been secondhand smoke. Her parents smoked like fiends in a house and in the cars when she, when she grew up. <clears throat> Certainly she didn't have any asbestos exposure. And the next one down on my list is silica. Well, for about 30 years she lived on a horse camp and they had a little off ranch. Anybody um, send your kids to the little off ranch? Or anybody ever been there? Horse camp? It's a horse camp in central Minnesota. Most of it is on sand. I can't say most of it, but most of the areas are on where the ride horses is on sand. Dusty place, they're always driving on these dusty roads. And I'm certain it's a combination of silica and secondhand smoke. Uh, 
Some other things that cause lung cancer are down in the you know, bottom there. Um, you know, diesel fuel, uh, hexavalent chromium, that's welding stainless steel, arsenic, beryllium, cadmium, you know, went into them very much. Coal products, nickel compounds. So, anyhow, I just had to throw that one at you. This radon gas, how did they determine that somebody got it from radon gas? I do have an answer for that. I was named our air quality for uh, Minnesota Department of Health, and the answer is that we have lots of information for miners that uh, they go down the mines, we know what the concentration of radon gas is in those mines, and then we can look at that, we know how long they've been down there, and then we'll look at their lung cancer rates as compared to non miners. So that is like some of the best uh, epidemiological data that we have on anything because we actually have human data to show that radon gas is bad. So, so, so a person has never been in a mine, let's say a person has never been in a mine, never did that work, and you live in Minnesota and a rambler, and you die of lung cancer. You know, how, I guess that's what I'm, I'm confused about. Uh, you can't. It's just a, it's just best guess. We, we know that, you know, if, if you're dying from lung cancer, you really cannot pinpoint it. For uh, like asbestos exposure causes mesothelioma, so you know most of the mesothelioma are caused by exposure to asbestos, and so you can pretty much pinpoint that to asbestos. Normally you don't get it from anything else. But when you get lung cancer, you don't know what it's coming from. I had another neighbor, I had another neighbor uh, died uh, three years ago, he was 50 years old, he died from lung cancer too. Never smoked or care of himself, just like uh, my sister-in-law, but uh, when he was like 25, he had thyroid cancer, and they really zapped him with radiation. Probably would start. Yeah. If that's best guess. My advice to you guys is if you smoke, stop smoking, test your house for radon, keep your exposure to all this other crap as little as possible for the rest of your life. Okay. But anyhow, we have some new levels. And uh, these are new, new rules. The principal exposure level is 50 micrograms. And we have an action level of 25 micrograms. So what you want to do for absolutely certain is be exposed to as little as possible. But if you have to be exposed to silica, uh, you want to be below the 50, but absolutely you want to be below the 25. Does that make sense to you guys? The action level will be that before you have to start taking action. Yes. The action level basically means that once you get at 25 and above, regulatory-wise, you need to take some action. My advice to you guys is that if you're working on stuff, whether it's silica or spray painting in your garage or you're out mowing your lawn, these things work great to take all kinds of particles out of here. You just will take silica out, you can take asbestos out, dust, pollen, spray paint, cheap, a couple bucks. Uh, I got these laying all over the place. I got them in my garage, I got them in my shed, I got them in my house. Man, if we ever have a pandemic, you guys can come over to my house, I better have one of them for each of you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Basically, uh, for you guys, the new rules cover uh, a variety of things. Uh, the bottom line is this is what we're looking for, okay? And these are the things that I have come up with that you guys probably do, stuff that's correct. Like chipping, sawing, cutting, drilling, grinding, sanding, crushing this rock. I just thought of all the things in the landscape that you see that I might be doing. And 
put it on the list. Uh, we basically have two OSHA standards. We have one for people that are working outside, and then we have one that we have for people that are working inside. So that video, when you saw the, the big saws and the people doing stuff indoors, that's a completely different standard. It's very, very similar to the outside one. It has the same exposure levels, but it's just a little different. All right, here's the way, our, here's the way it's laid out. I do have a copy if anyone wants to see it. <coughs> this is just the basic layout of all OSHA rules. I can't say all OSHA rules. Most of the, the newer rules are laid out in this format. So. All right, so this is uh, answering your question. Basically, if you have an exposure, that is above 25, then all the rules kick in. If you can show that it's below 25, then you don't need to do anything. Does that make sense to you guys? That's the action. Okay, so how do you guys know if your exposure is going to be above or below 25? You're working on something, you got a cloud of stuff coming out. I guarantee you that you got half, you have like three minutes before you're over my box. Literally, three minutes. Uh, you really don't. Why well, you have me? Uh, there is some guidance from a small entity, uh, OSHA small entity compliance guide for retrofill silica. And uh, they basically have some things that they have figured out that you can do that if you do it, and if you do it for 15 minutes or less, that you don't have to worry about. And those would be drilling. You just had a little regular hand hole towel drill. And you drill holes for 15 minutes or less, your exposure will be less than 25. If you're mixing concrete, Pouring footers, glass, walls, moving framework, or other things that are similar for 15 minutes or less, your exposure is going to be less than 25. It does not mean that you can take a skill saw with masonry blade and cut, cut blocks for 15 minutes. I guarantee you, if you do that, your exposure is going to be probably three or four hundred. Okay, so just similar type of stuff. Alright. The rules, the federal government spent a lot of money in testing, figuring out what exposure levels would be doing certain types of things. And they put together a table. Now, table one is uh, in the construction rules, and it basically has 18 different tasks <coughs> with certain types of equipment, and it tells you what you need to do to protect yourself when you're doing this. Okay, does that make sense to you guys? You don't have to figure it out. What you need to do is just look at the table. Okay, and we'll take a look at a table. Right here, here's one of them. Now there's 18 different tasks in this table. And a couple slides down, I'll show, show you what they are. This one basically, you're using a handheld or a stand mounted drill for the impact of rotor and hammer drill. Okay. And if the drill has commercially available shroud or colling that collects the dust. And you operate the thing according to manufacturer's instructions. And 
the dust collector actually works if you use the thing for less than four hours, you don't have to wear any kind of respirator. You can expect that your exposure to silica will be minimal. Okay? And it's the same thing if you use it for more than four hours. These things are really good at collecting the silica and getting it away from you so you don't have to breathe the stuff in. Pretty simple, isn't it? Okay. Put the next one here. Here's another one. A little different. We have handheld power saws, three blades, steel saw, masonry blade. You use the saw equipped with an integrated water delivery system that continually feeds the water to the blade. Means that when you're outside in the wintertime, it's going to be sloppy and cold for you to get wet. And you operate it according to the manufacturer's instructions. If you use it outdoors, which most of you guys are going to be doing, and you use it for less than four hours, you don't have to wear a respirator. Your exposure is going to be less than 0.5. Okay? However, if for some reason you're using it inside, that may not be the case. And so, you're required to wear a respirator that has a protection factor of at least 10. Okay? So that means that inside, stuff happens. You don't get enough circulation, you don't get enough ventilation. So you need to protect yourself from a respirator because there's potential that your exposure will be above 25. Okay, you use it for more than four hours outside, then you're going to need to use a respirator for the same thing on the inside. Uh, does the cable make sense to you guys? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, guess what the protection factor of this thing is? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this thing actually has the same protection factor as the rubber one you can start with two on. As long as you put them on right and you get some training on how to put them on, and then you fit test these just like you do a regular respirator. A regular rubber respirator. They don't have a protection factor of them. Yeah, there's a there's, there's issue with respirators. Uh, they, for cats now, a lot, what, what a lot of people do, what a lot of people buy with grant money is they buy these powered air purifying respirators. Basically, uh, a battery pack with a filter on it, a hose, and it goes up to your push, blow clean air over your face, nice and cool, the glasses don't clog up, and they got them down to $800,000 on the so they actually work really nice, so we actually buy lots of them for companies, uh, it creates a welding, anything that creates a lot of dust. Anyway, uh, take a look at our uh, OSHA book. These are the 18 different categories. So there's a table for each one of these. And uh, that looks just like this table here for each one of these uh, types of process. I just highlighted the ones in red that uh, you guys may use. Question? Uh, not quite sure what it is. Is it like a chop saw picture? Maybe? I'm 
I'm not quite sure, but there's a way to deal with new things. Okay? Well, we'll get there, we'll get there in a second. If it's not in this table, there's ways to deal with stuff that will make your life easier and have less of an exposure. Okay, so you can use the table. Okay, the thing about using the table is you've got to be really careful with following the manufacturer's instructions on how to care for the stuff, how to care for the equipment, and to use it properly. Okay. Uh, who does the table work for? The person actually doing the job or somebody that is right there with them. Okay? It doesn't mean somebody that's 10 feet away. There's somebody on a job site that's moving stuff back and forth. You don't have to worry about that. Okay. Makes sense to you. Think about the work being done, you're, you're doing this work, and you got this little dome around you of silicon. That's what you want to worry about. If you're over there, the second table back, yeah, you wouldn't have to worry about it. Make sense to you guys? Alright. Uh, I threw this in just to tell you that. Um, you know, uh, people are required to use, res use respirators. You need to have a respiratory protection program. Okay, it's a whole different thing. Okay, here we go with the alternate, alternate exposure control method. If you have equipment that is not listed in Table 1, you can use alternate control exposure assessments. Okay, what you will find is that <coughs> manufacturers of equipment will have done their own tests. They want to sell you the stuff. And so they have done their own tests. So if they have data that shows that your exposure using their equipment is below the action level you get the data from them, you use it the way that they recommend you use it, and then you're gonna be below the 25. So you can use that to show that your exposure is less than 25 rather than use the table. Now does that make sense to you guys? So you get the salesman that comes over and says, yeah, I got this great drill with a shroud on here, and it spews ethylene glycol in there and your exposure is nothing and it's not listed on the table, then you need to get the data from that company that shows that you have, that it will work for you. But you gotta be real careful in that you're using it in exactly the same way that they did the testing. Give me an example. You got drill the shroud around it and the testing was done when they're drilling into a ceiling, that's great. That shroud's going to catch everything because it's falling down into that shroud and you're drilling into the ceiling. Now how's that going to work if you're drilling sideways? Yeah, don't know because they didn't test it. So if you're drilling sideways, you can't rely on that data when they're Drilling into the ceiling. Okay, there's other ways to do it. Uh, we have both the performance option and a scheduled monitoring option. The performance option is basically, I think I explained that here. Basically, you collect information that says that what the tool that you're using and the way that you're using it will not give you exposure greater than 25, okay? So you might have, I don't know, you have a masonry institute, anything of that sort, landscapers association, da da da, where they've done a whole bunch of tests. If they've done a whole bunch of tests with the type of equipment that you're using 
and show that it's below 25, great. You get that stuff and you can use it to show that, yeah, this is not a problem. Uh, the last way, and probably the, the way most people don't want to do it, is you do your own testing. So you can do your own testing with your equipment to show that you're below 25. Right? You want testing done? I can do it for you. I've actually been on a lot of construction sites and, and sample for their silica exposure. Um, basically, uh, uh, I, I took a look at an exposure control plan a couple, three weeks ago, and uh, they had all this great testing equipment. Not testing equipment, this, uh, this, this high tech, state of the art equipment that uh, was listed on table one. And that's great. And then there's a paragraph about our some brand shop saw, and we're going to squirt water on it with a hose as we're cutting. And that uh, people that are doing this for more than four hours uh, are going to have to wear a respirator. And my first question to this company was, where'd you come up with this? Where's the data? How do you know it'll be okay? You know, and so the answer is, uh, the, the, we just assume from table one it'd be okay because you have saws with, you know, a water delivery system and their exposure is less than 25. Us hosing it down should be the same, right? So you have a guy standing hosing it all at the, all at the same time? Yeah, well. Two guys are in it. So one, so one guy saws it for a while, then he shoots it for a while, and then. For a while. I have no idea. It might work. It might, but they have to test because the saw wasn't designed to do that. So they're making stuff up. Great idea. I just don't know how well it's going to work. Might need two guys. I don't know. You duct tape a garden hose on your saw. You know, bailing wire probably work better. I guess. So where's all this water running to? All over the place. So, anyhow, here's uh, kind of the options of your objective data. The, the, the key is when you're, you're sampling, if you sample a guy with a chop, using a chop saw, you know, the big fan behind him and it's working, you can't assume that uh, it's going to be, it's going to, the exposure is going to be the same if the guy's using a handheld saw. You gotta, you, you gotta compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. All right. If you monitor and you find that the process that you're doing is okay, if you do your own sampling or have me come out, and you find that your chop saw or your skill saw with the holes on there is just fine, you don't have to monitor again. You can just use that for data. Say, hey, we did it. This is what we found. We don't have to do it again. However, if you find that uh, the sampling came out above the action level and below the permissible exposure level, you got to monitor again within six months to see if that's really true or not. Uh, if you're above the permissible exposure level, you're actually stuck in monitoring every three months until you can get the sampling sampling results to below the uh, permissible exposure level or to below the action level. And the key with all these is if stuff changes, you need to test it. So we test one day and it's in the rain, and it, the exposure that you're going to have in the rain obviously is going to be less than on that 90 degree day when there's no air movement at all. So, got to watch out for temperature and, and weather conditions. Yeah, I worry about that. All right. 
with all OSHA rules, if you have exposures to stuff in excess of the permissible exposure level, you need to do stuff to reduce your employee's exposure. All right, the first thing that we want to do is we want to do things engineering-wise to keep the exposure to as little as possible. <coughs> Sometimes that doesn't work. I was in a sandblast booth <coughs> last week on <coughs> Wednesday. There's not a darn thing you can do in sandblast to, to keep your exposure below the exposure level. Anybody ever see a sandblast pool? <laughs> These guys get it. Their suits and their supplied air respirators and they're blasting away with sand. And, well, you know, and if you don't have a respirator in, Reader in a sandblast booth that is horrifically bad in there. So just about everybody has light air respirators. Uh, what are things that you can do in a sandblast booth to reduce your silica exposure? What's the easy thing? Or a respirator? No. Ventilation That's still in the air. Ventilation system? Yeah, exhaust fan, obviously. Yeah. Exhaust fan, but doesn't help a lot in a sandblast booth. I mean, it's got to be a hurricane in there, and that still doesn't help much. Yes. Use a different product. Yeah, yeah, use a different product. Get rid of the sand. You have to blast with sand. No, you don't have to blast with sand. You can blast with glass beads. You can blast with uh, metal. And you can blast with uh, something that uh, had the black stuff that's made from power plant slate. You know, so those three those three products do not have silica in them. So if you blast with it, you don't have to worry about the silica. So yeah, that's what we call an engineer. Get rid of it. No, that's actually replacement. But engineering control is doing something to reduce the stuff in the air. Uh, silica um, is the only standard that I am aware of that allows you to use work practice control to keep a group employees' exposure down. That means rotate employees. You can do this for half an hour, you can do that for a half hour, you can do that for a half hour, you can do that for a half hour. And that's grudgingly acceptable for OSHA. So is there is there any time that you don't have to take exposure control methods? Like, <clears throat> can I just cut, throw a respirator on, and I'm good to cut as long as I want? Does that make sense? Can you rephrase that? Is, it, is there a time I don't have to take exposure control methods? Right, you're talking about how we got to lower exposure to the silica. Like, can I go and cut one cap out of place and re-glue it and put a respirator on and am I good if I don't have no dust collection? That's eight hours too, right? Time if if eight you hours. could show that you're below 25. For I mean, time you have like a chop saw yeah. or, or, or a, a handheld saw with a masonry blade, you're going to have to show that you're below the 25. But I, my, my guess, my question is, is do I have to take a dust control measure every time I cut, everywhere I go? Does it have to be a wet cut? Does it have to, or can I, does it have to have a vacuum system, or can I just go cut with the respirator on and I'm safe? Uh, no. You actually. If you're gonna if you're gonna cut with a, like a, a skill saw with a masonry blade, it doesn't matter how long you do that for. If you want to put a respirator on, definitely, right. but you would be actually in violation of the OSHA rules if you did that, and you didn't show that your exposure is less than 25. You're so, in the backyard. <laughs> so the only difference would be is that if you had a water delivery system for your partner's shop and you wore a mask, you could cut all day, right? Yeah, you could cut all day. Cut all day. So, yeah. And it's the only, yeah, yeah. It's basically for, for what you're doing, 
we have, I, I showed you a slide on the, uh, the small entity compliance guide. And they actually specifically said things about drilling and pouring concrete and taking off forms and stuff that they know that your exposure will be less than 25. You do that stuff for less than 15 minutes a day. Anything else that is going to produce silica, if it's not on that table, you have to show that your exposure is going to be less than 25. So uh, let me tell you how this works, is that if you're on a job site and an OSHA enforcement guy is there, he sees you take out that skill saw, put on a respirator, and uh, you cut one block, he's going to take a picture of you and he's going to say, okay, what's your exposure here? And if you go, eh, then they're going to write you a, a half ring. Yes? How do you calculate for that exposure line? You got to measure it. You either have to measure it or you have to have some kind of objective data that says that your exposure is doing, the process that you're doing is below 25. So where could I find objective data for the side by the stone for part of the salary? Because that's won't. really what I think a lot of people are talking about. No, you won't. That's the one that's going to get. That's the thing. You won't find it. <laughs> yes. Welcome to government. Do each individual contractor has to do this? For like his question there, could hypothetically Hedberg test it and then supply them that number? Or does each individual contractor have to have their own recording? You don't have to have your own. Have, like say Hedberg decides that they want, they think that using a skill saw for one cut will be okay, and they come up with a bunch of sampling results that shows that you know if you cut for a minute or less, you'll be okay. And if you got that with you, then you're fine. But somebody has to do it. It's either you have to do it or somebody else <coughs> has to do it. That makes sense to you guys. It's got it's got to be there somewhere. You just can't assume that cutting something for a minute is okay. Yes. Um, he was asking how you measure it, and you said you won't find it. Yeah. Well, then how can OSHA prove that it's open by they, just taking a picture of it? They don't. So who's, I mean, how can you be funny if they can't prove that you're over, but you can't prove that you're under? Uh, that's a good question. we got to go back a few slides. Unfortunately, I do. Right here, exposure assessment. And basically, the rules require that you do an exposure assessment. Now, if they see you do it, and they can't prove that you're over, they're going to write you a hazard item for not doing an exposure assessment. How they're going to they're going to say they're going to say, well, what's your exposure? And you go, uh, duh, I should be okay. I did so this for only a minute. Twenty-four, and, and, and they're going to say, okay. That's great. Where's your exposure assessment? How do you know? That's, that's the way they get you. So, you know, might you be okay for a minute? You might be okay if you just cut one block. You know, just put a big fan behind it. Blow it away. You probably will be okay. They're not going to get you for an overexposure because they didn't measure you. They have to show that you are actually over the 50 micrograms, but they're going to hit you with other things that you should have done. Yes? So it's been out for three years now, obviously, all of this. There's got to be, there's no institute out there that's done studies on some of this basic stuff on that shit. Anywhere we can go for a resource where I can say, hey, this is the saw I have, you want to try Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, you get on everybody's website that 
sells the equipment, then they have this exposure monitoring for you. Oh, but this is all, all stuff that has some kind of silica removal equipment. They have vacuum attachment, so they have water. If you just go to you know, Menards or Lowe's or Home Depot and buy a skill saw, you're not going to get data from from Akita on a regular skill saw that says that, uh, yeah, if you run this thing from in cut silica, cut, you know, cut, uh, cut granite for a minute, you'll be okay. So, there might be stuff out there, I haven't seen it. Okay, bottom line is, if you get equipment with dust control, some kind of dust control on there, it's going to be there. If you just got regular stuff, it's not going to be there. <coughs> there's where it gets kind of sticky. Okay, you guys clear on that? What? <coughs> Unhappy but clear. All right, here's, here's some examples of some of the equipment. And like I said, it's not. you see something like that, you got about three minutes. Realistically, you got about three minutes of my experience before doing a whole bunch of bullshit stuff. Depends on which way the wind blows, how much silica is actually in the product that you're cutting, you know, there's a lot of things that are involved. And I got pictures where you can't even see the guy. Oh, yes. On the picture on the left there, we have a giant fan behind that guy cut it. And yeah, when you come out, the professor is right next to him where he's got it, right next to his face where he's breathing. And it's under 25, that's okay, it doesn't matter if the bus is going back down the block and people are going to go and go. Yeah, it'll hurt us. Yeah. We can kill all the civilians you want. I mean, that's the reason we care about you guys. Those just protect employees. If you have a leak floor, right. and what would your thought be on I mean, you can't physically see any dust in that person's face is cut. That's the dust control method? It, it may work. So as long as we have you come up with that, you have to blow the crap away from you. So I mean, you have, have to do a cut. And you have to do a cut. If you don't have anything, and you're just going to go ahead and do it anyways, just go ahead and kind of blow it away from me as guys, much as you can. Guys are coming, and I'm like, I'm going to say, 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 I'm going but you have to have some kind of test data that shows it's under 25 yeah. in order to do it that way. You can do it, probably will work, but you got to prove that it'll work to OSHA, and so you're sitting in that spot where you didn't prove it to OSHA, they're going to write you a hazard anyway. So and the, the, yeah, the, why does it work? And the final, because you don't have that, right? You don't have the, you don't have the proof. Yeah. And that has to be on site or at the shop? Be anywhere. It doesn't have to be actually on site, but what will end up happening is you tell them you have it at the shop, and the OSHA guy will say, okay, send it to me. You have two days. How fast will you respond? Good. What's that? If I call you, you need something fast. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I'm a busy guy. I'm, I'm actually funny. So <laughs> You know, my next opening is actually in April, like April 10th. But sometimes I can get out to a place, and then when you call, I can get out, you know, somewhere close, and I can get out there. I, yeah, I can do it a couple of days. Yes, sir. So, since OSHA just cares about the employee, it's like that picture on the left where the guy's dry cutting. Can you dry cut as long as all your employees have good respirators? No control. Because um, if everyone's wearing full suits like that, can you dry cut? Pass the test? <laughs> you can, but you have to have OSHA monitoring data. 
If your dad is over the limits though and everyone's wearing good respirators, are you good then? No, you're not you're not good. You're in violation of a bunch of things. But you're somewhat protecting your employees. The OSHA doesn't view a respirator as a method to keep your exposure down. It's like your last resort. You use a respirator when nothing else works. And so if you go right to a respirator, it is bad news for OSHA. If that's your exposure plan, then be prepared for a bunch of OSHA violations. Yes, Ryan. I've got a, I've got a good story. It's, it's about lead paint. Because I'm a general, a licensed general contractor, and I don't see that class of lead paint. So Journal of Life Construction had a story a couple of years ago. Well, a contractor out in the East Coast, one of the towns, I don't know if that's the name of They were doing a strip of the house, or a strip of the outside, and taking off all the lead paint. And apparently it was in on the main street or something, and not a, not a good place. So the freaking dust, I guess, was flying like that. So you, you gotta catch it in the home, but you can't let it go down the street. So somebody called in, and the ocean guy got there, and he said, hey, you can tell the dollar fine or whatever. And I don't know whatever happened after the fact, but I don't think they had the story in there about what, what actually but the guy was a licensed general contractor, but he had a little cool class. And he thanked the guy on it, and then he said, that's the point. So I went, so if the guy's doing this, and you're going to speak of options, or what is that, or doing this, and that, that won't be a good thing on the bus ball going down the street. No, it's not good. Um, there is stuff in the rules that basically say that you need to keep uh, kind of in contained, not so much as in the, the lead standard. The lead standard is very specific to uh, have the contained stuff. Uh, with, it's unbelievable. With, with silica, it's not that way. So, yeah, this is the best part of going down the street. See what happens with silica is it's more dense than air and it drops out actually pretty quick. So, yeah. Okay, so here's an example of the same saw, dust control is shut off on the left side, the right side they actually have two dust controls going, and you can see the difference. Anytime you have something like that going, it's bad news. Whether it's at the backyard, working on your driveway, whatever. If you have something like that going, do something to protect yourself. Get a fan behind you, get the left right on. If you're actually at a job site, then you have to worry about it. Okay. Like I said, my advice to you guys is to keep your exposure to this crap to as little as you can over a lifetime. You know, one exposure like this, is that going to make any difference in your life? Probably not. It might, but probably not. Keep doing it over and over and over again. Odds of getting horrible diseases goes up and up and up with every time you do something. Okay. Got jackhammer and things in. Some of the things that are available for like drills, we have uh, vacuum attachments, we have drills to uh, put water on them, we have shrouds, cover the point of operation, dust extractors, you know, hollow pits out there, that can suck up the silk up through the hollow pits. There's a lot of engineering things that people have come up with to keep the proposal stuff. So if you can't buy this equipment, you can use it. If you buy the equipment, you can use it, and follow the instructions on cable one that you want. Okay, don't have stuff that's listed on cable one 
and again, we got to move that drill pin. All right, we don't have to worry about that. Basically, what this says is that if you're a respirator, you've got to comply with the respiratory standards. So you basically have to have a document that tells everyone uh, what kind of respirator they're using, what it's good for, how to put it on, how to take it off, how to change the cartridges, what the fit test, da da da. <coughs> okay, here's, here's the housekeeping part that's different than with the lead than with the lead story from Roger is that <coughs> what I can contribute to exposure to employees, you can't dry sweep, brush, use a compressed air thing, da 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 da. And you, and you want to use HEPA, HEPA vacuums if you can. Okay, is this going to be that big of a deal for the landscaping industry? No. Might be a big deal inside here, <coughs> where you're in a contained area, you're cutting stuff, uh, actually the concrete plants. Uh, and the block plants are having a heck of a time with this because they're dirty all the time on the inside. These machines leak sand all the time. And so how do, you, how do you get rid of a pile of sand on the floor without shoveling it? Literally, I mean, you go through a, a concrete plant or a block plant and you need a hard hat because the stuff is falling from everywhere. So this, this actually does play quite significantly in landscaping because we have to dry sweep when you do a patio. We can't wet sweep, we can't. And this is why it's such an issue with us too is we don't like to wet cut pavers because you can't lay your polymeric sand on the same day too. So, I mean, are, are we gonna get caught for dry sweeping polymeric sand around? Well, here's, here's the key with this. Take a look at this first statement here when it can contribute to exposure. That makes it tough for OSHA to actually write this up because they have to show that it's contributing to your exposure. So if you're dry sweeping, your face is up here, the sand's down there, nothing's coming up at all. Yeah, they, they probably will give you a grief for this. Oh, don't quote me on this. They probably will give you a grief, but it would be really hard to write this one. And you can just, in your, yeah, basically what your argument is that, well, I don't think it contributes to exposure. There are no other methods that will work that are feasible. You can't use a HEPA vac to clean up, you know, cubic yard of sand. Just it no, just I, doesn't work. And I don't, I mean, I don't know if OSHA knows the industry at all and as far as polymer haze and all the stuff that goes with patios and how to deliver a good product, that you, you can't avoid dry sweeping dust outside. It's, it's unavoidable in the industry and they can't come up with a regulation that restricts us from doing it when then we can't do our job. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's frustrating for us on the side that, that something like this comes up. Uh, I can tell you how a lot of the block plants deal with it. They sprinkle some crud on there <coughs> and then sweep it up. Some what? Some stuff. Some stuff that so will keep the dust sweeping down. Compound. We sweeping do that inside here, compound. but, but it doesn't it, we can't. They're it's sweeping it into a crack or a joint right. in order to set the joint. And then so it, it needs to go into the crack and just get all the wood Yeah. 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 So. Yeah, okay, so we're talking about two different things. Yeah. Yeah, if you're sweeping the sand into the crack, there's nothing you can do. I mean, you sweep it into the crack. You can't do a lap. And then you have to blow it. And then you have to blow it. Well, there's nothing we can do. Nothing you can do. So we can find a bunch of sawdust with some sticky stuff on it. Yeah. But what this is getting at is not you actually doing your job. This is you guys cleaning up after you're done. Does that make sense? You actually have to put the sand in the crack, and the way that you do that is you sprinkle the sand down there and you sweep it in. Well, that's part of the job. That's what you got to do. This does not. This is not talking about that. This is 
when they're all done, you got this mess underneath your chop saw, you got this leftover sand. How do you deal with that stuff? <coughs> you got to shovel it. You got way too much to to deal with in any other way, and you got to shovel it. You got to shovel it. So you have a hundred ton of recycled concrete delivered for your paver driveway, and the street has concrete dust in it from the trucks. You can't sweep it. Ooh, good question. Buff yeah, you Buff probably don't have as much of a choice. You can't wash it down the drain, the, the fish and wildlife service the end of our step. So, leaves it. Leaves it. Could be. Could be. Could be. Could be. Could be. Sweep it. <laughs> so then you just sweep it, or what, what would OSHA recommend? Uh, if it, this, this, OSHA doesn't recommend anything. Sure. <laughs> That's the funny part. It basically don't recommend anything, but if you have no other way to do it, you sweep it. But again, uh, the key to, key to this one is that the rule says when it will contribute to exposure. So, and so you got that part in here, and you also have the part that if uh, other methods will not work, then you can sweep and shovel. <coughs> but you have to have an answer. They come up and say, why are you sweeping this? And you go, uh, duh, uh. The boss said so? Yeah, the boss said so. It's not going to go very well. You tell them that, well, we can't do it any other way. We thought about HEPAVAC. Not about putting compound down and that's not useful, da 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 then they may buy that. Alright, I worked for ocean enforcement for eight years, so a lot of it falls on you guys. And that's where we're getting uh, that's where we get into a competent person. You know, you need to have a competent person on site. <coughs> that knows what's going on, what kind of equipment you should be using, what kind of exposures the people can expect to have, and to make corrective, corrective, uh, take corrective action that's needed. Somebody that has answers. Like the questions you're asking me right now. I mean, OSHA is gonna ask who your competent person is on site, and they're gonna ask questions about what do you do about housekeeping? And if the competent person goes, duh, well, guess what? You're going to beat up on it not having a competent person. The competent person has to have answers. We, we have to sweep because uh, our employees aren't getting sophisticated exposure from sweeping and there's no other way of doing it. You know, we look at HEPA facts, da 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 da. Get those answers? Yes, yeah, he's a competent person. If you get this, duh, uh, uh it's not a competent person, they're probably probably banging on you for not having a competent person on site. Has to be on site. No. It doesn't have to be on site, but the person has to be available on site and be in charge of the site. So you might have like a superintendent that has like five different sites that they get people going at and regularly visit them, make sure things are going fine, that's okay. All right, and for you guys, you need to have an exposure control plan. Basically, you need a document that says, this is how we do things. When we're chopping blocks, we're gonna use the chop saw with this water thing on it. And that will keep your exposure to below the action level. And uh, we can do that all day long if we want. Yeah, we use a chop saw without any uh, vacuum attachment on it. Uh, then you can wear a respirator. And our exposure monitoring has shown that we can do this for three minutes without being 
older than permissible exposure. So that's what the exposure control plan is, is that it describes the kind of work that you do, and then it describes what you're, what kind of equipment that you're using, and what the employees need to have to protect them. Make sense? It doesn't have to be a 50 page document like that I've been running into. It could be like two or three pages. If all you do is chop locks, it might be two paragraphs. That's the only silica producing activity that you have. We can literally be one paragraph. This is what we use. This is the saw. This has vacuum attachment on there. Uh, according to the manufacturer's data, we use this all day long. We'll be able to put the full level in the spot. Make sense to you guys? <coughs> What else shows up? This is what they're going to look for. Now, probably the first question. Let me see your culture control plan. That's the on site. Good question. Should have it on site. And you're the person that issues that? You're the person that can issue that? No. You've got to come up with it. This is specific to your company and to your task. If we have you come off that, I can't put the. I can come up with monitoring data for you, but you have to put your own exposure control plan together. I can look at it, see if it's okay. Like the one that I looked at a couple weeks ago, uh, they asked me to come out and take a look at this stuff, and I gave them an example of an exposure control plan and a scale, filled it all in, and it looked all wonderful. Except for the part about the dry cutting in the van. So the dry cat cutting the hole has a couple other little glitches in there. So when OSHA shows up, they're going to look for a competent person, they're going to look at your exposure control plan, and they're going to look at what you're doing. Nitty gritty details. Your guys are required to wear a respirator <coughs> 30 days or more a year. Have to have medical evaluation stuff. Basically, you got to send them in to a doctor. Have to check all these things. Uh, and then you need to get a report back from the doctor that basically says that yes, this person can do this job. That's basically about all you're going to get from the doctor. The employee will actually get a report that basically spells out that there's physical health. So they'll get the full report. Uh, whoever is the owner of the business will get just a document that says, yeah, they can do the job. Hey, any questions on that? This, this only needs to be done on employees that have exposures of 30 days or more a year where they have to wear a respirator. Okay. That part makes sense to you guys. Yes? Is there an hour limitation for, for the 30 days? Like, is it only four hours a day or something? Or no. If they just go on for 10 minutes? Like if, table, if Table 1 says that they need to wear a respirator, for that task, for the period of time they're doing that task, that counts as a day. Okay, so the table says that if they do this for more than four hours, they need to wear a respirator. And they do it for two hours, then that doesn't count. But they wear the respirator anyway. Does that make sense to you? So, so it's a period of time, and then is it in three years for when they start that period of time? What you, you have to, if you think that they're going to be exposed for more than 30 days a year to over the clinical exposure level, then you test them right away. If their job is, it's kind of, 
sitting there and his job is to cut block all day long and he does it all day long. And table one says, yeah, this guy needs to wear a respirator. Get the medical valve right off the bat. And then you can do it again in another three years. You still do the same job. Okay, we talked about that. And this is all open of stuff you have to train your employees. And the evil is the silica. So, if you want a copy of this training program, you're welcome to have it. I can give it to you. You can use it to train your employees. Everything I have is yours. Nothing is copyrighted. Feel free to take whatever I have. You can put your name on there. Take total credit for it, I don't care. I, what's funny with my job is I, uh, I go to these places and I start looking at their health and safety programs. And, and I look at it going, hey, this is written by some really, really smart guy. You know, one of my old ones that uh, somehow they got it from, from somebody else, you know. So this is perfect, I've never seen one. <laughs> Anyway, my job is uh, I'm, I'm a specialist in R&D. That's uh, rip off and distribute. So if I find something <laughs> really good, I will ask people if I can use it. And then I'll clean it up a little bit. And I'll put it in a form that anybody can use. I got this wonderful uh, um, monthly surveillance type thing, you know, where you walk around and take a look for hazards, hazard assessment in facilities. And, and I actually got that from uh, United Building Supply. They had like a six page one and I liked the way that it was laid out and I didn't like the one I had and I asked the guy, hey, can I take this and yeah, throw some stuff out, put some new stuff in it and give it to other people and he said, yeah, that's fine, just take our logo off. Cool. Grease him a little. Hmm? Grease him a little? No. God. He should, he should be paying me for all the stuff I help, yeah. help him with. He tried to kill me once. <laughs> Walking out of mezzanine in one of their, one of their stores and the, the actual underlayment gave way. I did the old walking on the, on the fog routine as I was going through the floor, you know. Yeah, this is the stuff that needs to be in your HASCOM programs. You need to train your employees on all the evil parts of uh, silica. In particular, you need to talk about cancer, lung effects, uh, immune system effects, kidney effects. Uh, all your employees need to know the hazards of their job. That's just basic stuff. They need to know how to use the equipment, how they can hurt, what they need to do to protect themselves. And then you need to keep uh, records of all this stuff. You do air tests, keep records of air tests. If uh, you're <coughs> training your employees, keep records of your training. I always look at who did the training, what was in the training, who attended the training, and what was in the training. I said that twice, but anyways, that's what I look for in records. Um, should have documents that say that if, they're, if uh, they had a medical evaluation, that, that's actually there. If uh, the employees are fit tested for respirators, you need to have that documentation. Um, if you have a medical, people that are required to wear respirators have to have a medical evaluation and make sure that the respirators aren't gonna kill them. So you need to have that documentation too. Yeah, it's all in effect. Looking for other stuff, there's a bunch of things on the OSHA website. I mean, you type, if you're looking for a silica exposure control plan, I, I have a couple, three of them, I think, in my, uh, in my hard drive. There's a jillion of them available. If you type in silica control plan, you'll come up with a nice one that'll work for you. My advice to 
you with a silicon control plan, keep it simple, a couple pages, three pages, specifically on what you do and how you do it. You don't have to have a 50 page document that spells out the rules. Nobody's going to look at a 50 page document. The, the silicon control plan is actually for your employees to understand. Are you able to share this PowerPoint with us if we're interested? Sure. If you could email it to us if we give you a card or something. We have a bunch of ocean jump drives right there. And it's got it on there? No. Oh. You can actually just take oh. them in a computer and go save as and Terrific. Want so I can send, them, send you home with one. Thank you. Oh, this is those ocean food jump drives. Are. <laughs> okay. Remember, my job is to help you. Call me up with your same questions. If you have any questions on a job site, you can give me a jingle. Just one warning, if you call my phone number, the chances of me answering are like zero. <laughs> but if you call the OSHA helpline, it's 651-284-5060, uh, uh, you will give it a live OSHA consultation person that will talk to you and, and answer your question. Okay? We don't record anything. Uh, if they take your name it's just be and your phone number, it's just in case we screw something up and need to call you back. Uh, everything that we do is confidential. OSHA enforcement doesn't know where I go out or what I do. Okay, remember that. OSHA enforcement doesn't know anything. They don't even know I'm out here. You can't tell them. I probably could. So, my job is to help you. If you have any questions, you can call.